You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by CBOE Live Vol. CBOE Live Vol is the leader in equity and index options trading technology, providing professional and retail traders with the most sophisticated options risk analysis, compliance, and trading tools. CBOE Live Vol offers a broad spectrum of advanced trading technology, including the Live Vol X, next generation execution platform, and Live Vol Pro, the new standard in options trading for front ends. Visit LiveVol.com for a 15-day free trial today. And by Russell Investments, the home of Russell Indexes, which calculates approximately 700,000 benchmarks daily, covering 98% of the investable market globally, including more than 80 countries and more than 10,000 securities. Approximately $4.1 trillion in assets are benchmarked to Russell Indexes. For more information on Russell Indexes and RBX, please visit russell.com slash indexes. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever interesting, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network. Quite a few programs for you guys to sink your teeth into. If you're into the hardcore Vol stuff, well, of course, you're on the right program. Vol Views has got you covered. Many great archive episodes of this one to sink your teeth into some great discussions, interviews, guests. I encourage you, if you're new or if you haven't done it in a while, head on back to the archives and really sort through those. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And, of course, you can always find those as well as all of our other programs, the Mothership, the Flagship, theoptionsinsider.com. While you're there, look around a little bit. we got some breaking news from the options market. we got a lot of education and analysis. we got a lot of unusual activity. I know you guys eat that up, as well as most actives and hot options reports and all the other cool stuff you guys have come to know and love from us. It's all there on the mothership. And if you want to just mainline the audio, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, as well as via our mobile app available for iOS, Android, and the ever-popular. I think they got some new tablets just this week, so maybe that is ever-popular. I don't know. The Fire... OS. And of course, you can always join us for this program, Volatility Views, live every Friday, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, by a Mixler, M I X L R. It's how you, the cool kids in the chat, can get the show before it's available to everybody else. You can see how the sausage is made. Hear all the fun behind the scenes stuff that goes on here on the show. Every Monday, excuse me, every Friday, <laughs> noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. However, you listen live after the fact via, you know, Czechoslovakian radio, however you get the program. We do love to hear from you guys. Hit us up, questions, comments, all that good stuff. You know the outlets, ad options, Twitter, stock twits, uh, questions at the Options Insider, or the website feedback form. You guys, no shortage of ways for you guys to hit us up. Many of you have done just that. If you got some, hit us up. We'll see if we can squeeze you in to the program today. And joining me on the old program, let's go, let's see, how, how we, let's go in order of on my screen and starting from, uh, let's go top to bottom, let's go in the corner office of the CBOE, where we are joined by Mr. Russell Rhodes. He and I were in the same room last week in Scottsdale. Now we're in the same city, but we're just about a mile apart. He's miled down the road over there at the CBO. I'm in the old Options Insider Studios, where I'm joined by Mr. Russell Rhodes. The I think he's still the Director of Education over there at the CBO. I'm not sure his title changes week to week. Mr. Rhodes, how's it going, and what are you this week? I'm still the Director of Education, but... 
uh, give it a week or two. I'm, I'm seeing how many titles can change before I print up new business cards. Uh, is it? But, but I think I, I kind of like being the director of education. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to work the words Mr. Corner Office into a, a business card that'll pass muster at CBOE. Just get a little, you know, go a little Vista print, do a little uh, home printing action. I'm sure, that, I'm sure they don't frown on that sort of thing at SIBO, printing up your own business cards. And someone who's familiar with that, of course, is my other cohort, my other volatility partner in crime, beaming in from parts unknown. I guess we'll find out soon. He is the greasy meatball, Mr. Mark Sebastian from optionpit.com. Mr. Meatball, how are you this fine Friday, and where are you beaming in from today? Well, you know, Mark, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there were exactly 10 towns that changed America, and I'm in one of them, and it's called Riverside, Illinois. So, I, do, I do need to find this list you keep referring to. This, is, this, is this like the Riverside, the Riverside no, Weekly Handbook? No, it was a, it was a thing. There are 10 towns that changed? It, no, it was a PBS special. So it was, uh, it was a, a big uh, – we, we were here. There was uh, – couple other uh we were the only town i think in illinois but there was a couple other ones that were, were untruth well. untruth untruth what was the other one pullman oh you're right pullman to... was in here yep. yeah you're right oh, i'm sorry i'm sorry i had to had to step in so well, there, there you have there it you it, go. Was, <laughs> it was us and pullman as we heat up the contentious interstate rivalry for which towns uh, changed America. If you have a town, if your town changed America, let us know. I'm guessing maybe your town. I can think of a few towns off the top of my head that may trump Riverside, Illinois. Maybe you got a few, too. Hit us up. Meanwhile, we'll keep on rolling <laughs> to the start of the show. Yes, it's time for the volatility review. <laughs> It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the Volatility Review. All right, everybody, like the man said, this is a portion of the program where we break down the week that wasn't indeed still is. We are recording this and streaming it live here Friday, 19th of May here as about noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. It's so right, right smack dab in the middle of the session. And the narrative earlier this week was, man, all that upside in VIX is really looking good. And that 50 cent guy, we'll get to him in a little bit. He's looking savvy and all this other stuff. And VIX, biggest day, biggest day in the history of ever and all this other fun stuff. Russell has the exact date on that. I'm, I, know there's a, I know there's been some controversy over that as well. And then here we are today, Friday, going into the weekend. Not, not even a long weekend, not even a holiday weekend where you typically would expect to see this type of aggressive erosion. Yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing. No doubt exactly exacerbated by the fact that the broad indexes are indeed rallying. It's as if that sell-off from a couple of days ago with the Trump special counsel, it never happened. Uh, most of the major indices up nearly 1%. And of course, uh, the weekend on top of this rally, on top of the just generally lessing of volatility anyway, after that big spike earlier this week, is combining for, I think, a shellacking, thwumping, call it whatever technical term you want, uh, VIX cash getting crushed today off nearly two and a half handles, or for you percent of a percent fans, and I know you're out there, uh, 16 and a half percent. I know Mr. Sebastian is just, he's, his ears are burning every time, every time I say that. That was a big topic of conversation this week as well, right around 12 and a quarter for those of you out there. So there is a chance that this implosion continues. It's got to implode pretty good because all of us were fairly fairly bearish on Henry. The flow master was a nine. He was south of the 10. He was in the single digits. Uh, so all of us were fairly bearish on volatility last week. Uh, Mr. Rhodes was the closest 11 and a quarter. So we'll see if we can get another points worth of erosion over the course of the next hour. Mr. Rhodes, you might be able to claim a rare victory, but since uh, we're not there yet, we shall see. Instead, let's go to the week that was and indeed still is. And it was a crazy one. I think we'll start with you, uh, Russell, because I know there was a lot of back and forth Sturm and Drong over over the big spike earlier this week and exactly how much it spiked. And everyone was asking us, uh, including uh, uh, what's this guy, Contango Trader, hits us up all the time. I think he's a he must be a devotee of yours, Mark, because he's always asking us how many percent VIX went up today, hashtag percent of percent. So he's clearly uh, maybe not a fan of that either. Uh, but I know this was a contentious issue, Mr. Rhodes. So let's start there. Uh, what exactly did we see this week and wh where does it rank in the all times VIX rankings? Where does which one rank within all the times VIX rankings? The May, 7th, the, the May 17th spike, yeah. 
And and who and, and 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 whose numbers are you using? Because there's big fights on Twitter about this. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying it's very contentious. Yeah. So where do you fall? I fall in it's ranked seventh. Um, uh, somebody else that works at CBOE claimed it was a tie for sixth, but that's because they fudge the numbers. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say it. Cause I don't even see how with rounding, they should have come up with that. I think they fudged the numbers for dramatic effect. Um, the, uh, August 21st, we were up 46.45% which even using a single decimal point should round up to 46.5, correct? Correct. That's by most, right. by most uh, rounding definitions I'm aware of, yes. And then we were up 46.38% uh, this past week. So that should come in behind August 21st, right? Yeah, it should. That's right. I, uh, I get, I, I get my, I, my tummy gets upset when people fudge numbers. I well, mean, and, non and, number fudger. And and let's talk about this whole percentage thing. I mean, oh good lord, that is, is that not really, that is not on the script. Is that really an appropriate way to actually evaluate how big the move was? I mean, Hell yeah, man. If if, <clears throat> if 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 buy something for ten sixty five and sell it at fifteen fifty nine, heck you yeah. Can't do, you can't do anything. You can't do that though. Okay, but you could do it in the futures. Yeah, and the futures did not move that much. I know they didn't. So you can make, so you're saying the futures didn't move 17 percent? No, um, the futures did <laughs> would move have made 17 percent. Yeah, oh. no, the futures are different. Uh, the futures are not a percentage. They are just what they are. You know, they are what they are. They're a price. I know. You you love having this conversation. We could have a whole hour. We could have a whole hour long show with Mark about the percent of percent. Why do you? You know. Why why spend time worrying about what is annoying? Well, if I just focus on what is. I like it. All right. I will focus on what is. <laughs> very, very zen of you. I think the common analogy is always, well, you know, talk about baseball as a percentage and people don't say those change percentages. But on the flip side, most of the broad investing public and even a lot of the uh, professional investing crowd, you know, they're used to seeing VIX just disseminated as this kind of just raw number. They don't think of really what it is. It's just this index that can move and is a tradable, quote unquote, product in and of itself. And so they see it in those terms and those products can move by percents and everything else. And they don't think about really what goes into the underlying mechanics. So but I think I think we, we fought that good fight for a while here. I think we have to just surrender that now. There is no there is no winning of that fight as VIX continues to grow in popularity and mind share and indeed market share. Uh, there's no way that that genie can't go back in the bottle. Percent of a percent is here to say as much as you and our friend here, uh, F Contango Trader, may hate it. Uh, it's it's here to stay. That said, uh, percent to percent debates aside, Mr. Meatball, and in addition, oh, oh, Russell, were you done or you have more to say first? I did have a little bit more to say. Uh, the one thing I do in, in, in when we talk about the correlation between VIX and the S&P 500 um, or the inverse correlation, we actually are using percentage numbers for that. Um, and, and I'm not trying to extend the argument here. I just wanted to definitely make that um, clarification. That, uh, that, that, I mean, and, and that's one, and, and really that's one of the reasons we stick with that percent number. And I totally understand what you're saying, Mark. I really do. I know and, you do. And I love you and I sympathize with you, but, it's uh, not a fight I'm going to win. I understand. Well, no, you can believe what you want to believe because you don't work here, but I work here. No, I know. I don't but... get to have my own beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get down that rabbit hole, Mr. Meatball, you have some of your own beliefs. Uh, what caught your eye? I'm sure it was a rocking and rolling week, not just for Carmen and Lime, where you guys actually like to trade a little thing called vol, but also over there in Option Pit with all of your little mentees and chatties are probably flying off the handle with all this craziness happening. And so what was catching your eye this week? Yeah, I mean, that move was nasty. We, um, you know, we did, we were trading and we were actually significantly, uh, I'm just going to flat out tell you what we did at Carmen Line Capital. So um, when I came in on, on um, Wednesday morning, we were short a lot of Vega, a lot. And just looking at the market, there are these days where you can tell that the, the open's a little muted and it's going to build on itself, especially when, uh, especially with, uh, you know, where kind of volatility has been trading. 
Um, and so when we saw the open, when we saw how things opened, we basically said, okay, um, we're short at these levels with a VIX of 10. And we think vol is going to, could be 15, 16 by the end of the day. Uh, let's just cover now and then we'll be able to sell. So that's kind of what we did. We covered just about every single contract we had on. Thankfully, I'd shut it down a bunch of stuff ahead of time. I actually closed a massive amount of short stuff on Monday and Tuesday. That's called taking your winners, folks. Uh, and then uh, with kind of the act price action yesterday, we put on, instead of kind of, normally I like to have short calls and things like that. So instead, when, when vol's really high, but I think it's going to snap back, I like buying puts or put spreads better than I like buying um, being short call spreads because I'm actually looking for a move lower, right? When you're looking for a move, you buy something. And when I'm looking for something not to happen, for instance, vol not going higher, that's when I sell stuff. Um, and in this case, I really did think that vol could go uh, significantly higher. I covered everything that I could. Uh, and then today, and then slowly bought some puts. And now today, with kind of the price action and seeing the way the June futures are trading, I started putting on some short call spreads and some other other pieces of, of my trading that I like to do. But, you know, one of the, I think one of the mistakes is just kind of dawned on me. One of the mistakes people make in not closing early is they don't realize that in leaving a position on to take heat, you're basically taking away your ability to um, get in when you want. And that was a nice thing. Yeah. Was it annoying covering stuff that I knew was probably going to go right back down? Yes. But was I able to get into the similar trades at better pricing now? Yes. So I, I'm, I'm annoyed and happy. It's, it's the way the life of the trader. So that's kind of the way things are. Carmeline now at, at option pit, you know, I think a lot, one of the trades we were playing around with was UVXY. Um, we were setting up uh, some UVXY diagonals, uh, long kind of the June 9 contract uh, puts, and then short a, a further out of the money put uh, in uh, next May, next week's options. Uh, and then finally, we, uh, we were hedging it off with a little call spread. It was a nice little, nice little trade. So I was very pleased. Just gonna say anno um, annoyed and happy. It sounds like your regular day over there. At, uh, yeah, I mean, Sebastian. it's never fun to close stuff for you know a wash or a small loser that you think will eventually work. But if it puts you in a position to put on other trades at, at even better pricing, then that's that's a win, and, and that's just the way you have to be willing to look at this stuff sometimes. No, we looked here, uh, speaking of looking at things, we always look at the futures. And the futures are still, uh, after this initial craziness earlier this week, uh, the term structure, as you might imagine, has flattened out the cash, getting back to not really a normal level, but a comparatively to earlier this week, certainly far more normal uh, level. And, of course, uh, the front month future, not much juice there. Two months out, about a point, point one point ten or so out there. So still back to a fairly flat structure all things considered and out there in skew land skew not particularly uh, crazy either about about a 137 over there in the cboe skew index and we all know it's not till you get into the 150s when all the hand wringing starts and the articles start coming out about uh, the zombie apocalypse because the skew is so high and all that that may have been us i'm just saying but uh, either way all the all the hand wringing about skew we're not quite there yet we're kind of in the mildly elevated but nothing really to write uh, right home about yet but there are a few things worth writing home about in the vix options land and you know when we're talking vix options we got to kick things off with my own personal favorite intro to a segment not the segment itself yes it's time for russell's weekly rundown now russell's weekly rundown all right everybody i know it's your favorite one of mine too as well the portion of the show where russell holds court for about 37 minutes or so about all things going on in weekly VIX options. I'm guessing actually in the last few weeks he's had a he's had to scramble a little bit. I got I got the pleasure of watching him do it live in front of me last week where he was scrambling for some data. I got a feeling this week won't be as hard as previous weeks. Is that certainly the case, Mr. Corner Officer? Oh, it wasn't that difficult this week, as you just put it. It's especially on Wednesday. But the 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 big trading that that actually you know I, I I try to prepare as the week goes along, 
and because I, I know how important this segment is to you and the success of the whole Option Insider Network. That's hmm. why it has its own theme music. Um, somebody who is, I, I gotta, we, we, we know Mr. 50 Cent, right? Yeah. We're all familiar with Mr. 50 Cent. Well, somebody out there is Mr. 250. Hmm. And that's not you, is it, Mark? No, it is not me. Okay. I wish. Uh, somebody on Monday, I mean, this is before all heck broke loose, uh, and, and it looks like they stuck what I'm getting ready to tell you about out, from what I can tell. Uh, they sold in, uh, in different 250 lots the, the May 24th 14 calls for 20 cents, which was a scary-looking trade midweek. Um, not so scary-looking now. Uh, the uh, they sold 600 of the 18 calls at 10 cents, and then as uh, the opportunity presented itself in several lots of 250 or 500, they sold 4,000 of the May 24th 19 calls for a dime. Probably, probably sweating a little bit on Wednesday. That, that makes the hairs on the back of my neck to stand up a little I bit. Ju- <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's it's and 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 it's you know. It, you're so tense that when the cat jumps off a windowsill and knocks a cup over, you think it's Jason. Yeah. How's that well, for an obscure image for everybody to try and have? But really, that, that kind of stuff scares the living. And those are straight-up trades. They're, those are not parts of spreads. Uh, I did some investigating on that. Um, not a whole lot happened on Tuesday. I Really, within the weekly space, nothing over a 250 lot. Needless to say, Wednesday... Uh, different different sides of the coin. Some people actually buying some of the calls. Uh, I wonder if some of it might have been covering. Uh, we had mm-hmm. a higher midday of uh, about 400 of the May 24th, uh, mid-morning of the May 24th, 14 calls. The, uh, the, the, we also had some sellers of puts. Uh, somebody sold 500 of the June 7th, 13 puts. Came back about 45 minutes later, and, and they sold them for a buck 45, and then sold uh, another 20, almost 2,500 in a bunch of 250 lots, and took in a buck 45. Uh, we also had somebody that that came in and later in the day sold several of the uh, the May 24th 1350 calls. Uh, I think they took 55 cents in for those. But there was a lot of, of short-term activity associated with <laughs> the spike in volatility on Wednesday. Um, today, things seem to have calmed down a bit. I haven't seen a really sizable weekly trade at all. Something I want to point out, something they – from Wednesday, and I will. associated with the kind of trading that we're seeing – um, Wednesday, we, we do a Vol 411 report for uh, CBOE TV, usually once a day midday. Uh, we decided Wednesday, because we had a little extra time, that we were going to do one that was an hour before the, uh, an hour after the open and then an hour before the close. And uh, I did both of them. And, and when I did the one, the hour uh, after the, um, after the, um, the open, there seemed to be some really aggressive trading in both directions, a lot of trading on both the bid and the offers. Uh, as the day went along and we kept working our way higher, uh, the percentage of trades that were executed at the natural market uh, continued to dissipate, uh, which which I'm wondering if somehow if I, if I can get the data from our buddies at LiveVol, if we could quantify that into its own type of panic indicator – uh, where people are being more aggressive in both directions because uh, they don't want to miss a trade either way. And then, That's and, fascinating. And, That's yeah, a I'm, fascinating I'm really, idea. This is one that, that I, I wanted to open up for conversation as well because uh, it's it's something that, that I was looking at, that I was wrapping my mind around. And and w- when we did the first episode of All 411 early, uh, I even said it looks like everybody's being very aggressive, so – uh, it just may be that this thing is going to continue to follow through for the day, and and Neil say it did. Uh, uh, being right and saying it to a camera doesn't make you any money, but no. it's uh, it's just another aspect of the market, uh, and, and an easy number to get off of the live all platform. That I want to see if they have historical numbers on that. 
because that oh, might be, be something that that, that would be fascinating because like I a, think a that buying zone pressure index or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I no, mean, you, I, yeah. I think that's a, a great idea, um, and especially in VIX, where you know, I, I mean, it's amazing some of the moves. Um, you know, that product in particular, the they, the way volatility can move, because. All right, we're going to go down a little bit of a of a derivative rabbit hole here, but on top of the fact that VIX itself is extremely volatile, the volatility of VIX, VVIX, is crazy volatile how much that thing can move. And so you will see options just fly in pricing. Um, today, I one of the spreads that I put on, by the time we had actually gotten the report back, the offer – the screen offer was through the trade price that we'd already yeah. that we that we tr- executed at. It was it was fascinating how quickly that index can that is that index the futures and um, the the vol the options can can move. It, it's I, I don't think people quite get how powerful of a product that that thing can be. If you don't do if if it's busy and you have something you want to do. And you think you're going to get cutesy and try and, and middle it? You will. By the time you're done middling, you will be chasing a, a bid or offer that is a dime away from where you where the original price you could have done it at. I mean, so when you have a strong conviction, you're better off, honestly, just doing it, it, it most of the time. That's that's been my experience. It's like the old real estate bubble days of 2007, 2000. It's kind of like it is back here in Chicago again these days. You see a place you like, you got you to gotta put the offer in that time. You can't come back. Can't go home and think about it because three offers have come in and the market has moved in between. Speaking of which, Russell, I like, I like your idea. I think that's a good one. I think, I think you should go for the FOMO, the fear of missing out indicator. What do you think of that? Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. FOMO, FOMO. I like it. That'll certainly, FOMO, yeah. everyone's talking about how to get the millennials in. You put out a FOMO indicator, the millennials will be all over you to uh, at least watch this thing, if not trade it. So there you go. My marketing invoice will be in the in the mail forthwith, sir, for your convenience. Uh, you know, but you, you did invoke him, so we have to discuss him. I know a lot of people out here are listening and looking to hear what's going on with this guy. There's been a lot of articles this week as well. He's kind of been the talk of the VIX world for the better part of the last month or so. Uh, with an article, I think Bloomberg and a few others had write-ups about our friend Mr. 50 Cent. We talked a couple weeks ago about how he's identified, I believe it was a fund out of London uh, that was doing this. Uh, one of the articles, just one of them, there were many of them, Bloomberg saying 50 Cent had a huge payday and a bunch of others. They broke it down, excuse me, saying they think that he made about $27 million. Of course, all of that is predicated on the fact that he actually took his hedges off, and there still is some size open interest. We'll get to We'll get to that in a little bit when we get to the hot strikes. I will note that the 30s are actually a little bit lower right now than they were when we put that list together down about 18,000 contracts. That's still not enough to cover our boy, Mr. 50 Cent. So he's still floating around out there. He didn't really take it off. And also, getting back to the point we've said before on this show many times, it doesn't seem credible that this guy is just straight up doing this naked, just loading up on all of these calls just for a day like this past Wednesday. Uh, it's probably... <laughs> To safe to say that he's got some other large structural short volatility or perhaps some other positions on uh, that where this these VIX calls are a hedge. So rather than him being excited by this Wednesday, he probably was mortified and probably run into cover. I don't know. Would you agree there, Mr. Mr. Meatball, that, that this week probably wasn't uh, Mr. 50 cents, despite what his options did, probably wasn't his favorite week of the year? No, this, it, that's what I keep saying is, is that, you know, he's doing this stuff because he's trying to make He's trying to make money, not because he's, you know, not because he, um, you know, on, on his back end, he's, he's not trying to make money on the front end. That, that's really the big difference. And, and the fact that, that people think that, you know, that this guy is, is actually making a big bad, a big bat, bat on actual volatility is silliness. Um, that just isn't the case. Mr. Rhodes, are you tired of being asked now about uh, about the 50 cent guy? I'm sure not just this show. We touch on him a little bit because it's fun, but uh, you must get just deluged with inquiries. I said Bloomberg writing about this week. Pretty much every, I think, Saqib, our friend and uh, listener of this program, I believe he's at Reuters, um, he also has written about this guy. Are you, are you tired of getting uh, deluged about this guy? I'm actually starting to learn so much that I feel like I shouldn't talk about it. Well, that's no fun on a program like this. Where we're all we I do know is, it is all we do is talk about things out sir. there, man. Let's talk in so, vague terms. I, I, the only thing I can tell you that that I, I kept a close eye on the options that he's involved in, or he or she, it could be, it could be a proper lady from London. 
you never know. We're being very, uh, very provincial or something. By Sexist. Not, I'm going to start referring to them as a they. How's that? That's brilliant. I'm Mr. in. 50 Cent's pronoun is it or they. There we go. Gender neutral trading. We're all for it but, here. Uh, but uh, no profits were taken. Yeah. I didn't uh, think he took any profits. Yeah. Or I, she. I, I couldn't come up with I And I looked hard. If, if, I was trying to, to so I could scoop if they, the if they, Hey, guess what? But, um, guess if, what? They, if they did, it's because of... Um, uh, if they did take profits, it was done via um, doing some sort of spread, not by uh, selling a different not, option. Yeah, that's the only way it's possible. I thought about that. I totally thought about it because that's actually that's how I would do it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's exactly how I'd do it. Maybe sell one that's a little bit slightly higher or some. I, you know, I I would totally leg into a uh, some yeah. sort of all spread. So it is. It is an alternative to, you know, we always say that you got to monetize these, th monetize volatility hedges if, if they're really going to be effective. And uh, when we say that, I think everybody automatically thinks selling the option that you own. Um, but a smarter trader is probably going to sell a different option. Yeah. I, and I, and that would be the way to do it is to leg into some sort of, um, you know, leg into a, a call spread or, or some sort of, of credit, you know, that would be the way to do it. Yeah. And, you know, that's what this guy might have done. Agreed. Lots of craziness. Let's get into the craziness of the week from a VIX, mothership VIX options perspective. As we mentioned, it was a, a big banner week. Let's see how we're stacking up today here, uh, coming on the latter half of the session. A little bit of a quiet week, given, surprising given the fact that VIX, as we mentioned at the top of the show, getting a thwacking, a shellacking, call it what you will, uh, off quite a bit. And yet only about 330,000 contracts, so less than half of the ADV going up so far today. So a bit of a quiet day. The rest of the week, though, not so much. 806,000 on Thursday. Again, the ADV right around 750. So most, pretty much every day this week except for Monday, north of that ADV. So I'm guessing we'll be higher this time next week as well. Uh, Wednesday, about 1.3 million. Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, of course, a big day. Tuesday, just a tick over a million, about 1.06. And Monday, the quiet day, only 533,000. We're getting up to those lofty levels. It was about 3.1 last night, about 3 to 1 right now. Uh, call over put in Vixland, where, where Russell starts to get nervous. I don't get nervous till about 4, 4.5 or 5. But Russell starts to get, he starts to get anxious. He's a very anxious guy. He starts to get sweaty around 3. So uh, drop him a line if you too feel that way in terms of we were talking before about the open interest what our friend 50 cent and others are up to let's get to it with the hot strikes for this week <clears throat> excuse me the hot top 10 vix strikes number one with the bullet as we said before the june 30s about three hundred and eight thousand. we compiled this last night it's actually worth noting that those 30s actually came off uh, a little bit as we are talking here uh, today the actual 30s right now is about 290,000. So that's been about an 18,000 contract difference. That's not enough for our friend 50 Cent to be coming in and closing out all of his positions, not by a long shot, but it does seem like there was a little bit of fluidity in that strike uh, since the last time we looked at it. Uh, 274,000 going up in the uh, number two spot for the June 35. So we're talking about uh, optimistic VIX players. That is indeed the case. 275 going up, 261 for number three. The far more reasonable by comparison, June 20s, uh, number four, the June 15s. Now we're playing, now we're playing in the meteor realm here of 256,000, right around a quarter of a million open there. Number five, the June 19s, 207,000 contracts. Uh, number six, the June 16th. So we're getting back into the old, uh, into the old, uh, into the old more reasonable realm. 182,000 contracts. Number seven. Again, it's mostly a June call strip. One put on the list, listeners. Uh, number seven, the June 25s. 165,000 contracts. Number eight, the June 18s. 161, number nine, the June 17s, with about 153,000. And rounding out our top 10 here for this week in Vixland, the June 11 half puts with 
let's see, 139,000 contracts and change. So some puts lighting it up on the list this week after all. Not all calls all the time, but mostly calls all the time. Most, pretty much all June this week as well, so no love for other months out there as well. Uh, total about 6.7 million open, uh, about 5.1 on the calls, about 1.6 on the puts. And we did actually notice a bit of a funky trade, which our friend, Mr. Corner Office, is actually going down to, uh, to investigate as we speak because we were pulling up our top trades for today. And I noticed that Mr. Rock Lobster, maybe, or Rock Lobster, I'm sorry, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Meatball, maybe you noticed this as well. Looks like 30,000 or roughly about 30 by 25,000 of the July 50s and 55s went up today. Yeah, I Vicks. saw those. Um, it was a customer he was selling. He sold the 50s for size at a nickel. And, um, you know, I was like, all right, if that's that's his prerogative, I suppose. But uh, it was not my favorite trade of the day. Let's just put it that way. So you're saying he did a stupid, he sold the 55s too? Or he, he buy a vertical? Uh, I know he sold the 50s. What's he buying the 55s uh, I for then? <laughs> I, I don't know, but I, he might have sold both. So it's entirely pl- pl- plausible that he sold both. That's um, a, so, a, a, a vertical stupid in July. Usually, in, for some reason, usually we see this weird stuff. In February, I don't know why February is the time when people usually people are buying crazy strikes, like they're buying the seventies and stuff. Uh, we don't usually see a lot of July uh, crazy upside. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm surprised he found a bid. I'll have to go see where he printed those fifty fives for because that. Where the hell did he find a bid? I think for futures those? were a little higher at the time, um, so I think it was relatively early in the day. And um, so, and given what we've just seen, hey, you know. If if there is some real, if, if we get another huge round of, of impeachment or Mueller, Mueller, is it Mueller or Mueller? Mueller, right? Yeah. Mueller. I mean, Mueller finds something, that's going to be a, uh, I mean, there are some serious bombs out there. And this guy's just look, feels like 50s a line in the sand that he can sell. And uh, he's looking to harvest a lot of premium uh, in the form of a nickel. And uh, thinks that the risk reward is there. I don't know that I would agree. You know, you know, uh, one nickname for uh, nickel options is is uh, cabs or cabinets. And uh, my old boss, Scott Kaplan, used to say people who sell cabs end up driving cabs. So I like uh, that. Good (laughs) good luck to this gentleman. But uh, I think he's uh, I think he's got. He's asking for it. And in a sign, a sign of his dedication to you, the listeners of this program, uh, as, we're spe- as we speak, listeners, Russell has taken off his headset, put down his microphone, and sprinted as fast as he can sprint. I've seen him run. It isn't that fast, listeners. All the way down to the Vix pit, which is a, a few floors below him over there in the CBOE. He's going to get to the bottom of this funky vertical for us. So there you go. Some live pit investigation going on for us here on the old ops volatility views and options insider radio network while we're waiting for him to come back mr meatball i know you were pretty active this week it was a pretty active week all along we heard russell break down uh, the weeklies you talked about our friend 50 cent we got this funky vertical uh, what else what else is going on what else caught your eye out here in vix options activity this this week sir that was about it i mean that that and then um there was a, a kind of a 50 cent copycat if you will that was uh, t- that traded um, a, a decent amount of a decent amount of, like the 19 calls just as I was trying to uh, to buy back a 1923 call spread. It really was a pain. Yeah, we we saw some of that. We also saw um, decent amount of uh, puts trading, which which kind of surprised me. But uh, there was a decent amount of uh, downside puts that were uh, available for for uh that were bought as people kind of playing the you know will volatility stay super low forever game uh there are clearly some people that uh were on the side of yes and uh were playing it that way and you know that was something that definitely caught my eye this week Speaking of things that caught your eye, we got a first here for the volatility views program got some live breaking news straight from the horse's mouth, straight from the Vicks pit, Mr. Rhodes, he's out of breath because he just ran all the way down there 
and all the way back. You missed it, Russell. I was telling people that that's that's just a, a sign of your level of commitment to the program, sir, that you would go all the way down there and do that just for our folks listening. What did you find, sir, down in the belly of the beast known as the Vix Pit? I didn't find out anything. Okay. well I'm I'll just kidding. Um, I, uh, I, well, to give everybody context, and I have no idea what you guys were saying while I was gone, uh, we do communicate with a little chat as the program goes along. And Mark Longo said, did I just see a July 50, that's right, 50, 50, 55 vertical go up in VIX options? And, uh, and, and I looked at the prices and I'm like, hmm, self, you have the ability to run down to the pit and ask questions. Go ask questions. So uh, the response I got was, it is not a vertical. Mm -mm. Somebody bought some July, bought like 25,000 July 55 calls for four cents and bought a buku of, uh, how many did they buy here? Like almost 30,000 of the July 50s. See, I thought they, I had thought they sold the 50s at a nickel. Nope. That was the, the way it was communicated to me from from my broker. So, I will. I I guess he was wrong. Buying both of them, and they because it's it's the price is the same on both of them. Yeah. So it wouldn't make any sense to have done it that way. But no. um, now the uh the 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 initial trade, the first trade was at eleven thirteen, and at that time, the offer it was zero by a nickel. And then um, you see a lot trade on the bid side, but I think that's where uh, the public customer was sitting there with a nickel bid, you know? Uh, yeah. People hit. Uh, and and I, I was like, I, my, my question was, really? And the response <laughs> I got was, I've seen stranger things on this trading floor, but not that many. Is, that is true. There is plenty of strange stuff. Interesting. With pe- people are already chiming in on this one. Your your co-host from last week, uh, Russell, Mr. Flowmaster Henry, he's in the chat room. He's saying he said he thought the fix 50, 55's papers sold both when the futures, the July futures were around 13 double. So he's weighing in on the sell side, too. But you got to trade from the horse's mouth, sir. They said I said they buy both of them. And I got a yeah. And I said, really? And yeah. So, uh, and, and I understand why this is one of the reasons I actually wanted to go down there. And this is one of those. Uh, people ask me how I know if something's a buy or a sell uh, typic- from the customer when I say that. Uh, and typically, I just look at if something trades on the bid or the offer. But the initial trades for the July 50 calls were when the market was zero by a nickel. And then it went a nickel by a dime. And when it went a nickel by a dime, um, I, think, uh, I, I think that the nickel bid was from a public customer. Not huh. from so and so that's why it would actually appear uh, w- without asking the question that it might be a seller as opposed to a buyer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting. So. Yeah, I mean there was uh, there is just uh, an amazing uh, amount of, of flow and liquidity. Yeah, a lot of times people don't know that you can just kind of tell by the way it traded, but then yeah. on these way way out of the money things, it can get a little confusing. Uh, vis-a-vis my own broker who's on the floor, uh, but obviously in a booth, just did not uh, didn't have this one uh, right, and that's just because the way it, w- it was communicated, and it, pro- and it went electron, and it was done electronically, I believe. Yeah. So yeah. that's the other piece. Ah, uh, the fun of volatility analysis. If multiple people contacting the floor, talking to their brokers, all getting different stories about what the hell actually went down, went up. Down there in the old Vix pit. What do you guys think out there, listeners? You think they're buying? Think they're selling? Would you? Would you buy? Would you sell the July fifties or the fifty fives for a nickel? Would you buy them? Would you do that stupid? Would you sell that stupid? Let us know. Hit us up. Speaking of, let's just see how we doing on time. Well, really quickly, we can hit on a little bit of uh, of earnings. I know you love your earnings, Mister uh, Mister Rhodes. We had a few popping off this week from an earnings volatility perspective. Probably the biggest one a lot of people were watching was Baba going up. Of course, uh, they came out earlier this week. They closed going into, they were before the bell. They closed the night before, right around 120.75 or so. They were pricing in about six bucks, so right around 5%. Uh, intraday, the next day, they they got sold off quite a bit. They actually sold off more than six bucks, almost seven. So outpacing their straddles to the downside, then rallied all the way back up. So if you were looking 
to scalp a little long premium there. You actually fared pretty well if you were savvy and judicious with your scalps. You end up closing right around 121.35, so actually up after all of that. So a nice uh, nice period of some scalping opportunity and probably a little bit of uh, popping some tums if you were short premium there uh, on BABA. But either way, no matter what side of the fence you were on, you had a chance to at least uh, cover some of your losses, make things not quite as painful. A Walmart, obviously a, a big name out there, leading the economic indicator. There were another one closing about seventy-five bucks. They were priced in about two and a quarter, uh, which is about three percent, and they rallied about two and two and a half. So they pretty much right in line with what we saw. And we also saw a Gap uh, last night uh, coming out after the bell. Uh, they were pricing in about two bucks, which is right around eight uh, percent for their straddle. I think they were they were well shy of that. When we last checked in the after hours, let's see really quickly here how they opened up today. Oh, they're selling off about 3.2%. So after they were rallying in the after hours, now selling off here. So net the move on the gap, actually outpacing their strat a little bit, uh, which is actually, no, still shy of it, but still a little bit more of a move, net move about 5% total from the high there to the low. So interesting stuff out here. Russell, I know you like to watch a lot of earnings. These or any others catching your eye this week? Um, You know, Honestly, VIX SPX kept all of my attention. <laughs> uh, it's all, it, it, I almost felt sorry for people that uh, that really would rather focus on um, earnings because the market kind of trumped anything that. Oh, I said trumped uh, anything that that m- you know might have occurred within the earnings arena. Uh, next week, I think we get some retailers. Uh, it's real interesting to watch um, what's going on in that space. Uh, as everybody, uh, you know, you know, yesterday I installed a putting green at the Options Institute now that I'm in charge and I was able to get everything that I needed without leaving my desk. Didn't have to go to Walmart and find me a putting green anymore. <laughs> so the the retail earnings are a lot more interesting than they used to be and uh, and, and what they say about the future as well. And, and that's kind of the part of earnings season we're in now. All right, let's get to your questions then. It's time to roll on into the volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL, posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, right. or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, welcome to the Vol Voicemail. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where you guys get to take the reins, questions, comments, insights. You know how to hit us up. He just ran through the whole list. Of course, you can always hit us up via the live Mixler stream as well, just like a bunch of you. I told you already, Flowmaster chiming in, saying uh, papers sold both uh, with the July futures around 13 double. Uh, he said a broker in the pit told him that. Could be color spoofing, maybe. Could be. Funkier things have gone up in Vixland before. This is some pretty size spoofing, though. 30,000 contracts are roughly thereabouts on each strike. So that would be aggressive. Uh, Vtrader also in the live chat. Vtrader168 saying, considering that there is a large vol jump Wednesday without a major event and the market recovery is not that strong, is it an indicator that the period of the extremely low VIX is over and VIX return to, quote, normal low and VIX will return maybe to, quote, normal low level. Uh, oh, I see what he's saying. So he's saying that, you know, the single digits time is done. Well, I don't know if today's price action is any indication. I don't know if uh, this, this to me screams that we're ready to race north again or stay. We didn't stay in those elevated levels for very long at all. You know, we've joked about it on this program in the past. You know, Mark and I have even said it, you know, given all the unknown unknowns like this special counsel floating out there that could drop at any moment. Uh, you know, it does seem like structurally VIX should have been a little bit higher than when it was in the single digits, low tens. But on the flip side, it's hard to argue with the math. And outside of this Wednesday, you know, realized vol is so- somewhere still in the anemic, I think around 6% in the S&P. So when you look at it from that strict hard math equation, which I know a lot of people do who are out there trying to harvest that premium, even a VIX of nine or 10 seems rich uh, by comparison. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm if I'm buying this argument, Mister Meatball. Are you buying what uh, Mister V Trader is selling here? That uh, is the period of extremely low VIX over. Are we going to return to a quote normal low level? I'm assuming that means somewhere in the low teens, maybe where we are now. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, dude, I, I thought nine point, I thought nine or eight percent was never going to happen. Um, but uh, you know, does it feel like maybe, uh, you know, maybe we get back into a range where eleven is at the low end and we hang between eleven and thirteen? Um, I think that makes sense while there's headline risk. Um, just the the amount of headline risk that there that is out there right now uh, around. Um, our president is uh, going to hold VIX, uh, I think, at least above above ten. Um, you know, so I'll be looking at like ten and a half as a low, but but maybe you know, thirteen as a high. And you know, for those that say, oh well, we can't go lower, take a look at the June ten and a half puts. They are nickel a dime and have traded a dime many many times today. Um, there are people that think a possibility of 1040 is entirely plausible. That is why those options still have a bid and a fair value of around 10 cents. So, um, you know, the idea that, that, oh yeah, well now that, that Trump's trumped it, uh, you know, had this, this whole debacle, uh, it's all over. You know what? A fair portion of smart money, which is what trades fix options, uh, does not, seem to uh to buy that hypothesis i'm looking right now the 10 half puts in june have about thirty-seven thousand contracts open their nickel bid at a dime as we speak with about 600 or so having gone up today mr mr rhodes what are your thoughts here are we heading back to the uh to the single digits or to the what he terms the uh the new the new normal normal low level of, of somewhere i think around where we are right now uh, I think we've going to have. I think there's a new risk premium with respect to uh, our current president that's going to remain in VIX for a while and probably keep us, you know, at least in the 11 range. Uh, but but I don't I don't I, I I have a hard time seeing a new low for 2017 being put in this year. I I do I agree with yeah. you. Um, I think 9.7 might have been it. So I think I'm on board with you, good old, good old Russ. A lot of our, a lot it's, of our. It's, it's a problem when we agree. It is a problem. That means we're definitely going to age. <laughs> we're so, well, we're so bad. Yeah, we had, well, we had debate on the on the on the VIX vertical before, so now we at least can have some consensus uh, on this. Our listeners, when we polled them last week, the mo- the majority, about 43 percent, said nine was the floor for 2017. So they're at least buying uh, what you're selling that we've already seen. Perhaps our lows. All right, I think we got time for one more here. Uh, let's see. How about this one? We got some crazy epic ones. Don't have time for those. Um, how about this one? This Valbug. He says, hi, this is for Valviews. Hello, Valbug. <laughs> Thanks for the show, Marks and Russell. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, he goes on to say, you mentioned that implied vol is often more than realized vol. Does the time frame of the option impact that calculation? For example, one monthly option is cheaper than for weekly options. Thanks. Interesting. It's an interesting phrasing. I don't think anyone's ever asked us this question uh, precisely like this. Obviously, implied is pretty much always over-realized, except for these weird aberrant moments where you, know, you see these crazy spikes and realized shoots up like this past Wednesday and things are hitting the fan. And that's when you see realized over. And when it realizes priced over implied, something funky is going on. So in all these scenarios, implied is going to be more. But that's an interesting way to break it down. I never thought of it that way before of breaking down four weeklies and maybe adding up the net aggregate amount versus uh, versus versus the monthly. I don't know, Russell, you're always crunching these kinds of numbers, like you said, on the way home from uh, OIC last week. You're going to do something like this. Uh, what do you have to say here for our friend Balbug? It depends. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, typically, you know, at, at it, it, and you start to relate it to the behavior of time decay around different option contracts. Um, if you if you take four at the money weeklies and compare it to a one month weekly, uh, the, the 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 implied vol of those options relative to the month long option, um, that th- th- there might be somewhat of a difference in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you've got uh, you know the longer time to go, you've got the the more possibility that we're going to move a lot in one direction or the other. If you take a bunch of out of the money options and and take four weeklies, and I'm doing this without looking at any numbers, I'm just using option theory to come up with this answer. I might be completely wrong, but uh, if you take deep out of the money 
um, weekly options, I wouldn't be surprised if there's not much of a difference from week to week, that the uh, the differences would show, uh, show up more in the at the money than the out of the money options. Mark, you've uh, you've studied the decay rates of out of the money options versus at the money. I know this is something that's maybe not the implied vol versus realized vol, but it all kind of comes down to the same argument, particularly when you're looking at stuff in the front week and it's eroding like crazy. Uh, what do you have to say for our friend Balbug, who was looking at it week to week versus a month, let's say? Well, you know, there you're right. Week to week, especially at the money, there is more to be made, and this is more obvious in like equity options than it is in uh, VIX options. But then the further out you go, the less that there is that premium. And actually, there is a certain level where if you go where if you get to about 20 delta, you will make more money being short the second week and buying back in at when the when it becomes the front week, than you will actually selling the front week option. Um, and that is because um, options kind of have their highest decay. I like to call it the cone of feasibility. And as, so as options become move from, hey, that could happen to, hey, there's no way that's happening, that is when they decay at their highest rate. So, um, you know, I, I say this all the time. People that don't close options for a nickel, they think they're, ma- they're so smart and they're saving money because they're not paying commissions. They are costing themselves more money in just holding on to that option and letting it go out worthless than the amount of money that than um, the amount of money they would be making off of selling that next month, that next week or month out at a level where its decay is at its fastest. So um, it, it, Russell's 100 percent right, but you have to really think there there are levels mm-hmm. where volatility straight up you you get more to be paid, to sell further out. Um, you make more money, you make more decay. And now the final piece, and Russell uh, will understand this, some of these cheapy, cheapy options, they are a margining nightmare if you're a market maker. They don't want them on their sheets. They don't want to sell worthless crap that costs them an arm and a leg in margin. So cheapy options that I like to call units, they will take forever to decay. An option that is... You know, I always try and show this to people. This option, I'll pull up an option that technically has three cents of theta and uh, with a week to go, and it's worth a nickel. And then I show them the same strike a, a week ahead, and it's still worth two cents. And they go, and I go, well, what happened? And they're like, well, I, I don't understand. I'm like, the model breaks down on these cheapy, cheap options mm-hmm. because people don't want to be short them. That's where the devil literally is in the details. I knew you had, you'd have a thing or two to say about uh, whenever we get into weeklies and comparative decay and vols, and that, that's up your alley. Great question here. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, Jedi Trader. Sorry, I'm messing it up here. V Trader. There you go. Great question. Uh, that's all we got time for. we got to keep on rolling. To our final segment, it's time for the Crystal Ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the Crystal Ball. All right, welcome to the Crystal Ball. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where we attempt to wrestle down that slippery pig known as Vix Cash. Uh, for this time next week, where will Vix Cash be at the end of the show uh, next week? Last week, it was me and he- I mean, me and Russell and Henry, a.k.a. the Flowmaster, he's lurking in the chat room now, so you can see how his prediction came out. And we were all uh, decidedly lower. Uh, you know, after the week before, I was almost eerily prescient. I was within like a tenth of a point, so, which is pretty much a bullseye in Vixland. This week, let's just say not so much. I was off about two handles. Uh, Henry was uh, even south of me. He was 990, so he was feeling that single-digit love. Uh, the market not responding this week, right, right about 1232 as we're wrapping up the show here. Russell, the closest, still about a handle away. But in this game, that counts at least as the close. I don't know if that's a victory. I think without beyond a handle is not really a victory. But let's say it, you get to go first at the very least. So we'll give you that. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, what are you feeling for this time next week, sir? Uh, wait, hold on. I got to look at my quote. I got to look at my quote. 1226. Is that where we are right now? Yep. I'm going with we are not going to change at all. Now we will change, but... We're going to land right where we are a week from today. I think the slow 12s is going to uh, 
it's gonna ho we're gonna hover around there. Um, I probably should go lower, but I'm not going to because is next week like is Friday a pre holiday weekend? Yeah. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, I'm still gonna stick with twelve twenty six. Oh, brave man, keeping the ball here. You know they're gonna erode that bad boy, uh, Mr. Meatball. I feel bad you didn't get a chance to play last week, so I'll let you go next. Uh, what are you What are you feeling for this weekend? Or next you know week? it was on. I wish you guys had asked me because I would have said tw I, my guess was going to be twelve thirty, and I it was completely <laughs> not, unfair. Not, not sixteen like two weeks ago, or whatever. And then no. you said nine. The week you said we went from sixteen you to nine. You could have given us a guess. You, you had know a, you could have. You had a seven handle swing in your crystal ball picks over the course of a week. <laughs> the funny thing is, is that 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 big swing actually won, as I recall, the the following week. Uh, I think that based on what I'm seeing. Um, you're going to see a, a, a an 11 handle again. I'm going to go 11.05. Hmm. I was feeling 11s. Mr. I, so I don't, don't let me ball go first because sometimes he likes to carp in on me. So I, that means I'm going to go beyond. I'm going to make this a nice wider strangle because I'm feeling a little bit shy too. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm not going to feel the uh, Henry single digit love, but I think we're going to be a little bit. I think that weekend is going to give us a nice little extra drubbing. So take it down to 11 or so and then push it a little bit farther because of the weekend. I'm going to say 10 75 for this wow. time next week so we're feeling all over the place here for our crystal ball here as we wrap up the show there's the music that means the show has come to an end listeners thanks for sticking with us it was a fun one we went all over the place we went to 50 cent vix land we went literally down to the vix pit just to figure out what the hell was going on for you guys out there that's our level of dedication to you guys we answered your questions we talked about all sorts of fun things in the weeklies and the futures and how much that spiked this week how where it really ranks on the top 10 all that good stuff uh check out the show notes if you want to see some of those fun graphs and charts for yourself but before we go let me check back in with my cohorts my partners in crime see what they're cooking up that may interest you let's start with you mr rhodes what's cooking in the land of cboe and indeed live vault I uh, got an updated BXY paper that I co-authored with uh, Mark Sebastian that will be coming out any moment now. Uh, Ooh. Just, just got to get it set up on the... I'm trying to get it... I'm trying to get it done because I'm going to the CFA International Confab in Philadelphia Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I, I'd like to be able to, to hand that out to some of the really smart CFA folks that are going to be there. Uh, next Thursday, it's Rutfest. We're doing Ooh. all day of Russell Index, and I know that's a little different than the volatility area, but uh, Russell Index-oriented, um, and even some IWM stuff uh, branching out now that we're partnered up with ETF.com. And then I'll be back here from the corner office a week from today. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that yeah, corner yeah. office you mentioned, or that, that co-author you mentioned there, sir, so I'll have to, uh, I'll have to check out some of his work. Well, I heard he's a jerk. Maybe we'll get him on the show two, one of these days if he's any good. But one's a silent one. Oh, okay. That's, <laughs> a, good, that's a good thing to have. And Mr. Meatball, yeah. what's cooking in the land of Pitt and Carmen line? Yeah, you know, um, let's talk a little bit about Carmen Line. We were, we're uh, things have been, uh, you know, without getting too in deep into details. Uh, if you're interested in getting some volatility exposure um, in a passive way via investing in a hedge fund, and you're a qualified accredited investor, reach out to me, Mark at CarmenLine dot at Mark at CarmenLine dot com or uh, Mark at OptionPit dot com. Either one will get to me. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to have a conversation about uh, what our approach is and um, why we like uh, trading the way that we do. There you go. You heard the man. Hit him up if you are indeed interested. And if you guys are hanging out in the chat right now live and you want, you're gonna, you're interested in you know all this crazy ball stuff going on in the commodity space. Is crude gonna hold above 50? Where are the options telling us gold, all the other fun stuff? To come back. At about 1.30 Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, what we're going to even do for it, make it even easier, is play some options news rundowns for you in the chat room so you can stay in there, listen to some fun updates on all the news from the world of options, and we'll be back here for the start of TWIFO at live at 1.30 Central. In the meantime, for those of you listening to Vol Views, we love you guys too, and we'll see you next week for more Volatility Views.
Volatility Views is brought to you by CBOE Live Vol. CBOE Live Vol is the leader in equity and index options trading technology, providing professional and retail traders with the most sophisticated options risk analysis, compliance, and trading tools. CBOE Live Vol offers a broad spectrum of advanced trading technology, including the Live Vol X, next generation execution platform, and Live Vol Pro, the new standard in options trading front ends. Visit LiveVol.com for a 15-day free trial today. And by Russell Investments, the home of Russell Indexes, which calculates approximately 700,000 benchmarks daily, covering 98% of the investable market globally, including more than 80 countries and more than 10,000 securities. Approximately $4.1 trillion in assets are benchmarked to Russell Indexes. For more information on Russell Indexes and RVX, please visit russell.com slash indexes. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.